Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second Human Resources Forum, um, facilitated by the PESA. My name is uh, Sam Kelo. Surname is Blom, so in Blomeki in Afrikaans. We had this session about uh, two months ago, so this is a follow-up uh, to that session. We're busy waiting for other people just to log in. This session is also being recorded thanks to Samantha and Coral uh, as well. As we have enough uh, people, you can be able to watch the recording uh, later on. Um, Andy, the CEO of the PESA is here to welcome everyone. Just gonna give a minute then for people just to be admitted. Then I'm gonna give over to Andy then to welcome everyone. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, Sam Kelo, if I can just in the meantime, ask all our guests to please just pop on to mute with your microphones. Thanks very much. Okay, we're just going to give us just 30 seconds more, and then we shall start. We've got about 22 participants, and they keep on um, logging in and coming in, as many as the South Africans who are now taking the vaccine. So the numbers are going up. Morning, Rashli. Welcome. We're just waiting for people just to uh, to log in, and we shall start. Good to see you in this session as well, uh, Rashli. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Okay, I think we can start. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to slightly cold and chilly Cape Town on this side. Some of you are joining us across South Africa from KZN, from Limpopo. Hopefully no one is joining us from Kabul airport in Afghanistan because there's no protection at that airport. Welcome to our second HR forum. My name is Sam Kelo, Say name is Blom. I'm the Western Cape uh, representative uh, for Bepesa. So I'm glad that all of you have joined. Without wasting time, let me hand over to Andy to welcome all of you, thank you. Good morning, Sam Keller, and uh, a special welcome to Johnny Goldberg. I know you'll introduce shortly. He's a friend of Bepesa, um, a real expert in his field, and we look forward to your address, Johnny. And a big welcome to um, all the guests on today's call and our Bepesa team. Sam Keller, fortunately, it's a spring day up in uh, Gauteng. I'm not, it's clearly not spring day in Kazadan and the Western Cape. Um, but uh, with it, we really do see the light at the end of what seems to have been a long, darkish tunnel. Um, as mentioned, this is the um, HR Forum. It's a really important um, forum for us to engage with people practitioners across the sector around um, what's changing and the way people work and the way people are managed and supported, um, particularly in the turbulent times that we find ourselves over the past 18 plus months and the changes that we expect to go through in the future. Um, one of the most um, significant and impactful um, change that we've all experienced is just shifting into this hybrid of working virtually and working physically. And uh, it's had great impact on um, how we engage with each other, how we work. It tests the way we, um, we guide and lead people. Policy frameworks around those are changing. We need to look at performance management differently. There are so many aspects of, of how do we equip ourselves for the future in this virtual Brad, world. can join me if I might on while you listen. That's just one of the many um, changes and impacts that we're dealing with. So it gives me great pleasure to um, open and open the second session and welcome everybody. 
to what will be, um, the part, uh, I think, part of an ongoing series on as regular basis as possible, as we can work together and co-create the future for our people practices in the sector to really ensure that we're setting everybody and each other up for success. So with that, um, I'm looking forward like you to a really interesting uh, and insightful session. And may I hand back to you, Sam Keller, please to um, officially introduce our guest. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thanks, um, Andy, for that brief intro and overview of why we, we are here. I see many people have joined. Uh, welcome, Anissa. Hey, Cheyenne, I see you there at Sigma. I can confirm that Sushi is from Japan, Cheyenne. Uh, David Wood, we see you, sir. Uh, uh, Fran, we see you. Um, Ina Freedom, we also see you. Uh, Mandre Lota, Monique Smith, Nita, my dear sister, special welcome as well. And then also, I have a sister as well, Sam Kelisi Wemata. Raveshni, we also want to welcome you. If I've not mentioned your name, we hope you enjoy this session. We wanted to make this session to be interactive, also to be full of robust debate and discussion. So once uh, Jonathan is done with his presentation, we'll be taking questions from the audience around COVID policies, any challenges that you might have, please feel free what to What did you ask. say to you? So without uh, wasting time, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Jonathan uh, Goldberg, who's going to be our presenter, but also is going to be answering some of the questions we, re we have around COVID uh, policies and rules and challenges at, at work. So Jonathan, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Samkelo. Thank you, Andy, for that kind introduction. Just a reminder, those people who are not on mute, we can hear your private discussions and that might be disastrous. So. We see on these teams and Zooms that if you're not muted, uh, you can run into a lot of trouble. So please mute yourselves. At the end, some Keller will facilitate questions for me. In preparation for today, we actually decided that we would actually only present one slide. And then I decided that I've got too much else to share with you. So I presented a couple of slides. These slides, uh, Bapesa has, and we'll distribute them to you for your own use uh, with your own, your own teams after today's session. So one of the big problems is if you look at the right hand side, John Berta and myself did a lot of work together with the team in global in respect of trying to unpack these range of laws that have come out in the last six months. And the problem with these laws and this diagram on the right hand side is effectively they've got far reaching effects in respect of your policies and procedures. So there has to be a complete review of policies and procedures because we've had this huge draft of legislation coming out in the last six months. They include on the right-hand side, um, the Cyber Crimes Act. We've got the old Electronic Communications Act, which affects how we communicate. And of course, now the Cyber Crimes Act making a criminal offense. Uh, it hasn't been put into law, but it's been assented to. So it's just ready for a signature. We have the traditional green area of the industrial relations, which we seem to be quite on top of except COVID swings a specific challenge in respect of absenteeism and um, vaccines and time off for of vaccines and quarantine and isolation. And then we have, of course, the diversity laws and equality laws coming out in the Employment Equity Act, PAPUDA, and the Protected Disclosures Act, which was a huge piece of legislation which you had to put in place um, recently. So you've had a deadline to put that in particular place, the 1st of August, and most of you have put the, the Protected Disclosures Act. Of course, Papuda affects not only um, yourselves, because employment equity of, uh, governs the issue around discrimination in respect to the workplace, but a Papuda affects you in respect of your suppliers, your contractors, and the rest of the community that you might do business with. So this is a great diagram to say, well, industrial relations green, we've probably got it quite sorted out. But cyber laws, I'm not so sure we got cyber laws sorted out because it's going to be a criminal offense now when you do repost a picture of myself in the nude. So I happen to be on, uh, sent a nude picture of myself to WhatsApp, my company WhatsApp group, instead of sending it to someone else who I, I don't know who I'd send a nude photograph to, but be that as it may. And of course, you then continue to post that and share that around. Potentially, that could be a crime. It wasn't intended for you. It was intended to my, to my partner, hypothetically. And I have a case I've dealt with in the last week exactly on that. And 
we just got to be understanding of that and communicate with our employees that there are serious implications about reposting some of the stuff. Of course, Papuda, of course, protected disclosures, and of course, the Employment Equity Act. But I'll talk a little bit more about that when I come to my final slide, which Sam and myself decided that's all we're going to present, but I decided to just go a little bit further. So we have the Cyber Crimes Act, we have the Electronic Communications Act, we have the Protected Disclosures Act, we have Protection of Personal Information, Poppy, and we've got the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act, Puda, and the Employment Equity Act. All these kind of acts, and some of them have got serious consequences of up to 10 years imprisonment for Andy and myself as CEOs, up to 10 million rand fines or 10% of annual turnovers, exclusion from tenders like the Employment Equity Act Amendment coming out this year, criminal liability and charges, and of course, li labor liability. So we just need to understand some of these acts. And I, together with John Butter, put this diagram together to show you how these acts interact, specifically the ones that just come out or about to be promulgated like the Cyber Crimes Act. So if you have an example of unfair discrimination by employer, that's myself as an employer against one of my employees in any policy or practice, then effective Papuda doesn't apply because Papuda applies outside the employment relationship. But the Employment Act does. If it involves a cyber crime, a distribution of some race, uh, religious or other event, that could be a crime. And of course, Poppy affects the communication and the distribution of information of employees. So one unfair discrimination, three potential acts. Now, unfair discrimination by an employee in the course of the scope against employees against other employees. So if one of our employees commits unfair discrimination. Of course, we've got this vicarious liability in the Employment Equity Act. So you as the employer on the hook, cyber crimes applies and Poppy as well. Because Poppy applies in respect of how does that person have access to that information? Have we got protections in place sufficiently to protect that information? Unfair discrimination by our employer, that's yourselves or myself against a job applicant. Papuda doesn't apply because that person's covered in terms of the Employment Equity Act. So again, we cannot discriminate against people in terms of applicants for employment. The famous case being Beverly Whitehead versus Woolworths, where Beverly Whitehead was pregnant and Woolworths didn't employ her. And on that particular basis, she won her case because it was discrimination. The only time a job applicant has rights is in terms of the Employment Equity Act. You may not discriminate based on race, sex, color, religion, age, or any arbitrary ground against the person applying for a job. The Cyber Crimes Act could apply and Poppy could apply too because you have the information of that job applicant. Unfair discrimination by a company employers, employees against non-employees, then of course, Papuda does apply. The Employee Employment Equity Act doesn't, but Cyber Crimes and Poppy could apply. So you can just see this myriad of potential cases where these four pieces of legislation could apply. And I think this table is wonderful to unpack with your teams to say, ladies and gentlemen, we need to get our heads around this legislation. We can't just take it piecemeal that we must wait for a contravention to take place. Um, unfair discrimination by employing a private or personal context. Of course, Papuda applies, employment equity doesn't, but cyber crimes and poppy might. And any act in the context of cyber crimes, cyber violence, damage property or people, unlawful access to systems like, of course, potentially all the acts apply. So just to show you graphically that these four pieces of legislation that are either being amended, the Employment Equity Act, or coming into be or being rejected or being assented to like cyber crimes have got significant implications in the next, some of it immediately and in the next couple of months in your organizations. So, Again, it doesn't help speaking about this and scaring you about it. We got to, as lawyers, as advisors, as the experts, try to give you some guidelines in respect to what you need to do. Well, labor laws, I think you need to upgrade your disciplinary codes in any case, because most of them are outdated. And, 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 and you know, I get really angry when I keep on seeing outdated disciplinary codes. Dealt with a case this week of absconsion. And abscon the, the term absconsion means intention never to return to work effectively that's something we should be charging the person with so i think in regard to COVID, i drafted a clause overnight or to a company for a company in their contract of employment around vaccinations compulsory vaccinations and compulsory testing and paying for testing so they're saying they reserve the right in work circumstances where you cannot have social distancing to have compulsory vaccinations for COVID and any other pandemic. Two, 
that where employees working on another site and they require testing and you haven't been vaccinated, then effectively you must, you must then pay for the test yourself. So there's all these things in codes, conducts, policies, procedures, and contracts that need to be relooked at. Update grievance procedures. I think that's important, something you should consider too while you're updating your policies. In terms of cyber laws, I think you need to update your electronic communication policy, update your poppy policy. Hopefully it's been updated as of the 1st of August. Update your social media policy, commercial agreements, and employment contracts. Your commercial agreements, uh, of course, are important too in respect to your suppliers, your contractors. And the quality laws, I think you need to update your BE policy, your employment equity policy, your diversity policy, your commercial agreements, and your employment contracts. So that's the areas that we think you need to look at going forward in respect of all this legislation. Of course, governance could involve tip-off and crime link lines. Uh, one of the big issues in South Africa is the protection of people who do come forward with tip-offs. Audit and Risk Committee should have oversight to this as well as social and ethic committees. Transformation Committee should also have oversight. It needs to be advocacy and awareness. One thing that I can't understand, as employers, we seem to miss the obvious issue around educating our employees regularly, around updating them, making them aware of the consequences of reposting stuff that they got that they shouldn't have got, like my new picture as a bad example. Stakeholder capacitation and, of course, policy alignment and integration is what we believe. One of the things that I got asked to address today is this issue around voluntary vaccinations versus compulsory vaccination. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to confront this debate head on because your customers, suppliers are going to do it in any case. And we see now university institutions around the world saying, you want to come back to campus? Compulsory vaccination. We see that happening worldwide. We see that in banks. We see that in airlines. We see that across the world. And of course, we're going to see that in many organizations in South Africa. Now, if you want to go for compulsory vaccinations, you need to do three major things. One, conduct a risk assessment in terms of the direction, C19 risk assessment, develop or amend the existing work plan, workplace plan and outlining the measures you intend to implement in respect of vaccination of these employees, and consult the risk assessment and plan with any representative trade unions and any occupational health and safety committee. So through COVID, occupational health and safety committees have now been elevated in respect of their responsibilities and what we need. So that's really what we need to do as employers. I also ask you as employers, one of the considerations you've got to do is, of course, consider, are you, have you got a health and safety environment with unvaccinated people not at the work site? So that's a question that's going to have to be answered in this contentious debate, I accept it, around compulsory and voluntary vaccinations. Just to refresh and ready to leave you, I don't intend to go through everything. But effectively, he has a checklist what you need to do as an employer in terms of the direction on occupational health and safety, whether you do a voluntary site or a compulsory site. So whatever you do, you have to go through these kind of processes. And one thing we did uh, yesterday and the day before, we helped the client implement a voluntary um, vaccination policy where they actually offer an incentive to employees in respect of vaccination. So when they're vaccinated, they get five grand cash, if you want to know the amount, uh, to encourage the voluntary approach. They haven't decided to go for compulsory, but she has a wonderful checklist that will be emailed to all of you. Uh, Some Keller will do that with the team, uh, we'll email to you so you can just check that your sites comply or a mandatory vaccination employer. So to put it all together, and this was the slide that some Keller and myself decided we were only going to flight was to cause some debate because we really wanted a question and answer session rather than a lecture session, because in 40 minutes you can't really do much. But if you look at the scheme of arrangements in terms of law, and I talked to the slide, let's start 1st of July 2021, Poppy and Arto. So Arto's in, it's got implications for drivers and people driving vehicles. Maybe not so much in your industry, but you need to see whether that happens. So if I lose my license, which I'm a shrubby world because I get a number of speeding fines, not because I drive very fast, but I often drive the coastal route to Cape Town and effectively you can't drive really past George 
uh, and Meisner and the wilderness without getting a fine. It's impossible. So auto will mean that after a couple of fines, I'll lose my license. But that's not a problem for my job because I could get a driver, I could get an Uber, I could get a range of issues in respect of trying to account to that. But Poppy, huge implications meant to be implemented. And again, the real question with Poppy from the regulator's perspective is what have you done to protect personal information? Imminent is the Cyber Crimes, Cyber Crimes Act, and I've already spoken to that in the introduction, and of course, new papaya regulations. We saw some come out yesterday, so that's imminent. Amendments to Puda, the, uh, the whole issue around discrimination beyond the workplace, uh, and comes out in the, towards the third and fourth quarter. Coida amendments, the Coida Amendment Bill has now come out, and of course, new papaya regulations, which we're expecting in the fourth quarter. Of course, further, we've seen late on this year, company amendment bill, of course, there's been a proposal that um, we have worker representatives on companies' boards uh, that went down like a lead balloon to, to most of us in the business community, but be that as may, there's a strong proposal from the Department of Trading Industry in respect of employee representatives in certain companies as a full seat on the board of directors, which means full access to disclosure of all the information, because as you know, as a board member, you get access to all that information. The occupation health and safety amendments coming through in the first quarter, and of course, we're expecting cannabis amendments. That doesn't mean you can smoke cannabis at the workplace, ladies and gentlemen. It means that effectively you'll be able to legally smoke cannabis at your house, grow cannabis for your personal use, but still, not be able to smoke cannabis before you come to work. And that's gonna be the difficult test as to what you do with cannabis. The simple answer to that, if I could give you a quick, quick answer around that a difficult, complicated subject would be what you could do in respect of cannabis is treat it like alcohol. I'm strongly opposed to regular testing, uh, medical testing, because I think you get into a range of trouble. I think you've got to test when you see a deviation of behavior, a change of behavior. And then critically, we've got the Employment Equity Act amendments. And I put that in red, ladies and gentlemen, because those amendments are going to say that you've got to meet certain sectoral targets within a three-year period, or else you won't get a certificate to trade with government, a B certificate, and you won't be able to do business with any quasi-government, any municipality, or any organ of the state. That is critically important for your particular business. And let me be frank here. I don't think that the average South African employer does enough in respect of employment equity. I don't think we are that uh, fastidious and that detailed in respect of our recruitment and recruitment process, as well as giving people a chance in order to progress. And the stats indicate that on the employment equity recent uh, reports from the Employment Equity Commission. Of course, on the 15th of January 2022, you've got to submit your employment equity report, EA2 and EA4. I don't want to stand still there, Samakello, for a minute. If you don't submit that on time, they, you are non-compliant. So effectively, you can't go on holiday in December. I know the oil industry doesn't go on holiday, and I salute you for that. But the reality of the fact is you, can, you can't go on holiday unless you submitted that in December. Because if you miss that deadline of that, support, that report, then effectively you are non-compliant. There's no way around that. There's no exemption. There's no, I fell over the bus. Uh, I fell in front of the bus or whatever, or I sick. You can't then be compliant as a company, and that's got serious complica complications and implications for your business. There's national minimum wage review, of course, on the 1st of March, 2022, and we understand that the labor unions, because I sit as a commissioner on the National Minimum Wage Commission, are going to push for an increase beyond inflation. So it's not going to be inflation increase, it's going to be inflation plus increase. Of course, us as business representatives will fight that strongly, but that's what's coming. And then, of course, R2 is going to be fully effective 1st of July 2022. That's when I will lose my license. Hopefully I won't, but uh, that's when we all will be in real big trouble when we get simple traffic fines and simple speeding fines at, say, 17 or 60K zone, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at that legislation, and again, what's not in this diagram, some color which has come up this week, is that NEDLAC, we are now renegotiating labor legislation. The trade unions have put together a list of demands of amendments to South African labor law, including four weeks completed year of service severance packages, including extending the 189A retrenchment procedure beyond the 60 days. They proposals, ladies and gentlemen, don't fall off your chairs at home. 
or fall down or have a heart attack or have another double espresso, they are proposals. We've put counter proposals in business, including a relaxation of Section 189 uh, of the labor legislation, including exemptions from the one week of pre of service. But we're in for an uphill battle here because the Department of Employment and Labor has already indicated that they are not averse to two weeks per complete year of service for retrenchment in terms of retrenchment package. So we've got an uphill battle here in regard to another set of rounds of negotiations that will last at least six months. I'm leading those negotiations on behalf of business, but I can tell you our work's cut out for us in respect of those amendments. So that comes on top of all this other legislation. So what do we recommend to you in respect of countering this one? is we believe in a workforce strategy and a blend, uh, speaking to a CEO of uh, international, list, uh, international Motor Company the other day, said to me, you know, Johnny, I, I, I truly believe, and I supported this, my financial director doesn't have to sit in Johannesburg or in East London. He can sit in Stuttgart, no problem. And again, I think that is a big, big issue for me is in terms of workplace strategy and blend, we keep on wanting to throw permanent person at it. Second of all, not all jobs are permanent. You could job it and get a part of that job done. So I think we need to look at the workforce strategy, blend of fixed term contracts, temporary employment services, full-time employees, jobbing, international uh, resources, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, very, very importantly in a workforce strategy blend to my mind is independent contracts. I think we need to look at our employment contracts, HR policies, and manu manuals. Many of you are involved in disciplinary inquiries. Again, I think we've got to go for an expedited disciplinary inquiry process. I wanted to write an article today, but uh, some killer in preparation for today. I didn't have time, but my article, I will write it today. My article is going to read the following. The presidential spokesperson was suspended for about six months because her she was, a, she, she was a, 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 a director and owner of companies that were involved in procurement of, um, of, of, of goods and services in respect of COVID, so PPE. Uh, and she's now received a, fine, a written warning from, from, from the presidency in respect to disparate inquiry. And my article goes as follows. Why does it take six months? And second of all, what kind of sanction is a written warning when you didn't disclose issues that you're meant to disclose in terms of your contractual obligations to the state, simple as that. So again, what message does that send out to everyone in respect of how one should deal with, mis with workplace misconduct? And that's serious misconduct because again, the World Health Organization said the fraud and corruption around PP in South Africa was akin to murder. Exactly, they, they didn't mince their particular words around that, but be that as it may. So. You know, I think we've got to go for expedited disparate inquiries. I can tell you, I could have finished that inquiry within a day. If, they, if the president had commissioned me for a day, I would have sorted of that inquiry, found her guilty instead of a long investigation that produced X. Uh, I kept on saying that to the DA with uh, Patricia DeLol. If you believe you have a case against her, then prosecute her. If you don't, leave her alone. It's as simple as that. So these inquiries go on for too long, even internally in your own organizations. I think we should expedite disparate inquiries. I think that's a critical issue. The other issue is, of course, the risk assessments and ongoing workplace plans in respect to your vaccination policy. Are you going to be a compulsory vaccination site or aren't you? Are you going to encourage employees to get vaccinated? We have a new variant in South Africa, and we don't know where that variant's going to. So again, this thing's evolving and changing all the time. One thing we do know is vaccinations do produce a Wimbledon final, semi-final playoffs that are full to the audience. And then straight after that, a European Euro soccer final at, at Wembley across the road where the stadiums were packed. So again, one's going to have to consider this very, very carefully. And of course, the heightened role of occupational health and safety committees, they've been elevated and we need to ensure that they're capacitated because they've got to be involved in the system. Mark my words, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have a situation in your centers where effective in your workplaces, where other people who have been vaccinated are going to feel uncomfortable sitting next to an unvaccinated person. Watch this space. So to my mind, even trade union membership, shop stewards, workers are going to drive the issue around compulsory vaccination. I think one of the issues we also got to consider around employment equity and the uh, gap analysis that you've got to report on in terms of the top and the bottom, uh, we've got to look at the remuneration policy across all levels. 
uh, Genio coefficient and metrics to dis of disclosure because you have to report on horizontal income differentials. And ladies and gentlemen, my experience as a person who's uh, gray and bald at the same time, effectively, I think some people are overpaid and some people are underpaid. So I truly believe that in all your organizations, I put it out to you that you have people that are paid too much for what they do, and you have some people who are paid too little. And I think that debate needs to happen. So I'm big time into reorganizing the remuneration uh, structure and policies within particular companies that really that really excites me in respect to ensuring that overall our costs may be reduced, but we pay the people correctly in respect of the value they bring to the organization. So again, looking forward to some of the recommendations. I think you need new skill sets today. I think the digital era is, is upon us. And I, again, if people don't have digital skill sets, it's a real big problem. Connectivity, being able to use the modern apparatus of Zoom, Teams, and other picker things is a basic essential, even for us lawyers. And we were the last party to the party. So effectively, amongst our organization, we compelled this. We did a di digital strategy intervention on Mirror, which is much more difficult than Zoom or Teams, to, to every single person in the organization to ensure that people start to get digitally equipped, as an example. Key HR metrics need to be monitored. I mean, one of the things I think we need to really relook at is performance management. I think um, this issue around uh, six monthly or, or annual performance measurements, I think is outdated. I think we need to have much more quick, efficient type measurement of performance. And I think we need to take action much quicker when there's underperformance. And we don't do that generally. We don't generally act quick enough in respect to poor performing areas. And I think it's a big, big downfall. And every single time, every single time you don't act expeditedly, it comes back to bite you every single time in my career. I've seen that. That's the issue. Cyber and discrimination take a new role of importance, as I've said in the introduction. And of course, remote work and our remote work policies. We are going to battle to get our people who've been working for a year and eight months or a year and six months remotely back to the workplace. And that's going to be a big battle. And of course, my strategy is, well, if you're fully vaccinated, you should go back to work. Now, of course, this week, we have the announcement of a new variant, which throws this all into disarray once, 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 once again. So Sam, Sam Keller, that's my real introduction to today. Uh, I think there's a lot upon you as people in the space of managing employees, as executives, uh, as people who are managers. But I think we need to try to simplify that. And that's my job and my team is to try to simplify this complicated legislation into bite-sized chunks with one objective, to make the organization more productive, to make the workplace a better place to work at. Because the one thing that COVID has produced, and I've never seen it in my 35 year career, we have to have empathy. And effectively, if we have empathy, now empathy doesn't mean you don't, you, you are soft. Empathy means that you understand people are going through huge trauma. Family members died, family members sick, themselves sick, et cetera, et cetera. Reduced income, fear, the rights in KwaZulu Natal and, and Gauteng added to that. There's got to be empathy, but at the same time, it's having the empathy together with keeping the structure and productivity of the organization there. Thank you. I open myself to any questions that I might be able to answer. Over to you, Samkela. Uh, thank you very much, um, Johnny, for that overview, but also at times highly. Uh, legal and technical as well. Uh, personally, I need to thank you for something that you've done. I've always wondered why when I drive along the N2, I always get tickets in George and Neisner. You have now have confirmed that Simkelo is because there are uh, cameras on the way. So I will advise my wife that a legal friend of mine has informed me of this. Thank you very much. There are some questions that have come to the chat and Coral would also go ahead and just share those questions for you to respond to them. Thanks, Coral. Excellent. Thank you, um, Sam Kelo. So, uh, Johnny, a question from uh, Cheyenne. Is incentivizing employees to take the vaccine ethically and morally correct, i.e., in effect, excluding and impacting those who choose not to? Just a thought. Thanks very much. It's a good thought. I deal with that yesterday, actually. Uh, and I was quite clear on my advice. You know, it's like a bonus. So 
you know, you achieve and you get the bonus, you don't achieve, you don't get the bonus. So the real question was, uh, technically, the people who can't get the vaccine, say for health reasons, do we not discriminate against them? And no, we don't, because it's not discrimination. It's not based on sex, age, race, religion. It's based on the fact you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. We've taken the scientific approach as a company, and the scientific approach overwhelmingly says vaccinate is better. We're encouraging people to vaccinate, and we are paying people a bonus for that. I don't think you run any risk in regard to discrimination or any disadvantage to other picketed people. Remember, team, there are going to be many compulsory vaccination sites in South Africa. We're running a couple out at the moment, helping companies with compulsory vaccination sites. So again, that's, that's where a lot of companies will be going. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, and just to the floor before I read the next question, if you do have a question and you would like to come on camera and come off mute, please just raise a hand and uh, we'll happily take your questions. Uh, the next question is from Purvasheni. The question is, can an employer ask employees if people that live in their household, i.e. family members or workers are registered for or vaccinated? I think there's nothing wrong with asking people. So in other words, we have a comp we, we people like Johnny, I work for you and I'm vaccinated. Can you ask whether other people are vaccinated in your household? I think you can, but I don't think you can do anything if they refuse to give that information. So we're trying to do a protection group to see where our employees are. The problem I, that I have with that and is why originally I was anti-compulsory vaccinations in most workplaces is effectively what good does that do? Because you then got to ask, are you vaccinated with everyone that you, are, are the people that you socialize with also vaccinated? Because how does that help? So again, and if you have young kids and they are infected and under the age 18, your vaccinations are only open for 18 and above, you run into trouble. So I wouldn't go down the route. I don't advise going, asking those questions. I don't think there's anything wrong with asking them legally, but I think it's, it's a nowhere street. You're gonna end up nowhere. With, the, with those particular answers, and you're just going to run into a range of complications. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Johnny. Sam Killer, I'm going to hand back to you. I don't see any questions further in the chat. Excellent. No, thanks, uh, Coral. As Coral has mentioned, if you've got any questions, please just raise your hand or go on camera and ask. Johnny, right in the beginning, you started with quite a number of challenges. One of the ones you mentioned was you did not understand this policy or this um, this breakage where a person is being charged with absconsion. And you said it doesn't make sense to have something like that. I know it's deviation from COVID. Just clarify it again, because I'm thinking we are a BPO and ITO or shared services. We have that in our policy and we are charging. Just clarify where, where things have gone wrong and what's the implication for us. Sure, thank you. So. One of the things I said right in the beginning was uh, you need to review your disciplinary code. So most disciplinary codes historically have the words, if you're absent from work for more than five days, hypothetically, that's desertion or absconsion. Now, desertion or absconsion are military terms where you deserted, you intended never to return. And I read a case and I had an advisor on it this week where the person was charged with desertion and effectively the arbitrator found that the person intended to come back to work, but it was just absent for the five days. So the correct charge should be absence from the workplace for five days without notifying the employee. That's the actual charge. So we should get away from these terminology that are historic, that are inappropriate and refresh our codes to be more simpler and describe what we actually, what the actual offense is. And the offense in most codes is absence from the workplace and more importantly, absent from the workplace without informing the employer. Thank you. Excellent, no, that's fine. So to go back then to my example and sorry, for becoming finicky on this. I see there's a question from Yumna, but Coral will ask that question. So if I'm working for my call center in Kabul and I don't come to work, but my employer charges me with abstention, they're gonna lose that uh, because it's not clearly put in there as a charge. So that case, I will still have to, I will still be employed because the charge was not laid out correctly. Look, yeah, I think, uh, I think you run risk. And, and the question is, I'm trying to run risk. The real charge is, absent from work for five days without informing the employer. It's as simply, simply put as that. And I think we should get around, get away from terminology that's, that's bad. If you're gonna charge a person with gross negligence and you've got to prove gross as an example, 
describe in the charge what the person did rather than try to rely on these over legalistic terms. Thank you. Excellent. That's fine. Thanks. Quarrel, over to you on the questions on the chat. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Sam Kello. Question from Yumna is as follows. If an employee refuses to be vaccinated and you are a compulsory vaccination operation, what would the rest of the process entail? Could they be dismissed? The simple answer which government officials avert to uh, and, 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 and scoot around all the time, I was on a ENCA the other day with uh, the Director General. The, the, the simple answer that is yes, you can be dismissed. But that's why I put out the matrix for you in these slides to show it's, you've got to follow the process in terms of number one, determining whether you're going to be the site and doing the plan, consulting about the plan. But ultimately, even if you have got medical grounds and you cannot accommodate that person anywhere else, remotely or somewhere else, then effectively you could be dismissed. That's a simple answer. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Johnny. Another question from Purvashini. In terms of updating our disciplinary codes, where can I find guidance? Uh, you can email me and I'll send you a, 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 a sample, uh, a sample uh, disciplinary code. Great, we'll help with that process. Thanks very much. A question from Andy. Where do you see labor regulations headed with regards to gig economy type work, i.e. micro jobbing for a company, less than minimum hours, holding multiple jobs, benefits linked to part-time jobbing work, performance management and disciplinary management for virtual workers and gig workers? Uh, it's a complicated question, but I would expect that from Andy. The first thing is uh, you've got to determine are these workers, are they employees, are they independent contractors? And I think for most jobbing arrangements with multiple employers, they're probably independent contractors. So I pay you to take the photograph, I tell you to, ma to make 100 calls or 1,000 calls at the following quality standard, and I pay you per call. Simple as that. Labor legislation is never going to catch up with the gig economy. And that's the that's a sad reality. Trade unions are going to put their heads in the sand and think it's not happening. And the gig economy is just going to take over. We have it already. If you look at FIFA and all these particular sites where you can get the jobbing and the work done. Um, I think one of the important questions, Andy, is benefits. And we've seen that in COVID that without UIF protection, that these uh, workers in the gig economy are already left high and dry. But then again, in our response to that demand, we need to expand the definition of employee to include these gig workers, these independent contractors. Is they should then have private insurance because if a person takes a job and they need to contribute to a fund, it's ad hoc. So how do you monitor that? And the UIF is set up for specifically employees who get regular income and contribute regularly. So. I don't think labor law will catch up with the gig economy, but I think there's huge opportunity and my slide in front of you talks about workforce strategy and blend, because any employer is not considering this blend, that your FD doesn't have to sit in Joburg necessarily, could be sitting somewhere else, could be actually doing two jobs as an FD because the FD doesn't require the, the full uh, 23 day work week, work month, et cetera, et cetera, I think is important. So Andy, it's complicated. The big demand is going to be for some type of insurance for them, uh, but that's complicated in itself because of the irregular nature of their picket income and potentially multiple sources of their picket income. And if you look at it worldwide, effectively, a lot of employers who are skilled specifically prefer the jobbing, the independent contract route, rather than the issue of an employee. Let's get that down to some basics in South Africa, Uber drivers are employees of someone. The guys who are driving the checkers 60 minute um, scooters, motorbikes are employees of someone. So you can't get around that, but they are actually more sophisticated models than that. But in those simple examples, I'm clear that in South African labor laws it's defined now, Uber drivers are employees of someone and the scooter drivers are employees of someone. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Johnny. Sam Killer, I'm going to hand back to you. 
Excellent. Uh, thanks, uh, Carl. Um, in terms of some practical issues, uh, on the bottom left, uh, Johnny did volunteer and uh, provide his details. Uh, his company's name is Global Business Solution, and he has kindly agreed to help us uh, in this session. You are more than welcome to contact him for further advice and guidance. Thanks, Johnny. There are his details and telephone numbers, including a person called John Botha. This is not that other Botha from George, I would imagine. So uh, you're more than welcome. There are the details. These slides will be sent to you uh, from Pepesa as, as well. Johnny, uh, you also spoke about a, a C119 risk assessment. Would you mind just unpacking what is that? A C19 risk assessment, just for the benefit of, of, of some of us, please. So sure, in the one slide I presented earlier on, it actually shows you what you need to do for, for companies or employers that have more than 10 employees, you all got to do a risk assessment, whether a compulsory vaccination site or a voluntary vaccination site. And that's do a risk assessment in terms of the occupation health and safety direction. And that's a checklist that's in the, the, the earlier slide. Um, that I put up. So this is the check, I'm trying to go backwards here. This is the checklist that you've got to look at uh, in respect of your compliance with the occupational health and safety risk assessment. That's what you want to do. Each particular employer on this call has to do that. And I would imagine would have done that in regard to that direction. Thank you, Sam. Okay, that's good. And then also you spoke about health environment, what Africans calls omgeving, health environment for unvaccinated people. Am I hearing you correctly? You're saying that we've got a working space. So in our working space on third floor, 10th floor, we need to designate a space for unvaccinated employees. Did I hear you correctly? No, no, that's not correct. But I mean, again, if you decide to have a compulsory vaccination site, one of the alternatives before you get to a dismissal would be, could you have a workspace with only people who are unvaccinated? So in other words, a call center where people who medically, religious-wise or otherwise are not taking the vaccine, could they be located all together and accept that risk, that it's a high-risk environment, uh, a higher-risk environment? No, uh, clearly you don't have to create those particular spaces. Uh, vaccinated and unvaccinated in a non-obligatory, -ob non uh, compulsory vaccination site would all work together. And that's why, Samkela, I was, uh, I, and I'm, I, I'm changing because uh, my wife says, how can I change my view? I said, because I'm a lawyer and lawyers can change the view. One day we can give you that advice and the next day we can give you the other advice. But the reality of the fact is, again, it's difficult because of the variance, but more and more and more, I see international trends and local trends going for compulsory vaccination sites. Um, and I think that's going to be a trend. The big, big issue is the question that was asked to me around asking whether your family members are vaccinated. It's, it's a bit pointless to my mind if I'm socializing with unvaccinated people because the latest science indicates that I can still be a carrier. A vaccinated person can still be a carrier, double vaccinated or single vaccinated with Johnson & Johnson. So, you know, to my mind, it's a little bit of defeatist, of the defeatist objective if we do it at workplace, but still we can't control what's happening beyond the workplace. Thanks, Sam Keller. Excellent. No, that's fine. And um, thank you very much. Uh, also, just add from the audience, please feel free to raise your questions or type them in the chat and Coral will graciously um, ask those, uh, those questions. You also spoke about discrimination beyond workplace. Is this when I'm sitting at home and seeing a comment on Facebook uh, that is discriminatory and I click like, or is this when I'm making a comment at a braai or I'm driving in my car with my friends and I use the K word or any other thing? What do you mean by discrimination beyond the workplace? And by the way, Johnny, I'm outside work, so why must it affect me? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, uh, if it relates back to the workplace, then then, then it's a serious offence. So um, I'll give you a classic example. So I don't like you. You're my boss. I wait for you. As you get out the company premises, I hit you. Uh, and then you say, well, that's outside the workplace. I can do what I want. It re relates back to the workplace. Now with social media, um, we dismissed a senior executive of a particular company, not a senior executive, but a senior manager of a company because he posted a religious rant on his Facebook page. Of course, on his Facebook page, he proudly said that he's a senior manager of XYZ company. 
again, did he get dismissed? Yes, he did get dismissed because effectively the religious group that he was ranting about from Australia contacted the local company and said, listen, yeah, unless you do something about this, we've picked this up, we'll boycott your products in Australia. Mm -hmm. So again, it has consequences. So your racist uh, jab, uh, which is caught on social media, which is posted by you, the liking of a racist uh, type comment, uh, clearly could get you to trouble. But again, Sam, let's just unpack that properly. If we've got all these policies that we are anti the stuff at the workplace, surely we want people to work, work for us who are anti it at their home place too. Or do you have two types of personalities? You're a racist at home, but when you come to work, you go through the, 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 the jick at the door. So effectively, you're not a racist. You, you're cleansed. I mean, that's the problem we sit with. You can't be, you can't be both. And I think that's the communication and education that we need to have at the workplace. So your outside of work conduct, if it gets to the, I always used to use examples. So you have the, the CEO of a business and he goes to a cricket match. And uh, in the old days, when you used to go watch cricket, Sam, uh, you used to have a couple of beers and the CEO decides to strip and run the pitch. And his next day is the headlines of the star with his picture of him, CEO of ESCOM stripping. What do you think would happen to under the director if that happened? Of course, you'd be dismissed by the board because I suppose you would say, Sam, it depends what he looks like in the nude, but uh, let's assume he doesn't look very good in the nude. The point is he would bring ESCOM into disrepute. You can't have a CEO streaking uh, at the one risk cricket pitch across the pitch. He might've been off duty, but it brings the company into disrepute. Thanks, Sankela. Excellent. And then coming back uh, to, the, uh, to the vaccination and COVID, if I work for, com for company X and um, my relative Opa or Oma or Dani who comes from Van der Bale Park or Sibo Sisha who comes from Umlazi, they are my relatives and they become positive. Am I duty bound to inform my employer that at home or my relative or my girlfriend or my partner, am I duty bound to inform my employer? Or can my employer make a policy as such? So it's not me who's COVID positive, but a family member. Am I bound to inform my employer of that? Duty yes, to you are. You're duty bound if you had a if you've had a high risk exposure, uh, which is less than a meter and a half apart for more than ten minutes. Someone's infected. You are duty bound to inform the employer, and you're duty bound in terms of the law to isolate. And if my employer becomes aware, if my employer becomes aware that some Kelo has not done this yet, he knowingly and willfully was aware of this. What can my what can the employer do? So now they are aware that some Kelo did not disclose, and yet he was aware. What can they do? Well, there's a labor court case, the first one that's come out, where the person report to work while he was waiting for the outcome of his test, and he got dismissed. And the labor court said that dismissal is fair. So. I think, uh, first of all, you're breaching the law, it's a criminal offence, and second of all, uh, I think it's a dismissal offence in most organisations. Maybe not in the presidency, I can't wait to write the article to say a written warning for the presidential spokesman is an absolute joke, uh, but be that as it may, that will be an article for later today. Again, I think it's a dismissal offence, Sam Keller. Excellent, that's fine. Coral, any questions on the chat box on your side? No further questions, Sam Pello. Just a reminder that I'm just going to read out for anybody who hasn't seen. Uh, a reminder to all operators that the PESA has a mandatory GBS COVID protocol that needs to be adhered to and reported on weekly. If you need more information, please reach out to Tracy, T R A C I, at bepesa.org.za. A question has actually just come in again from Cheyenne. Um, the question goes as follows Inherent requirements of the job and linked discrimination versus mandatory vaccine in workplaces. It is an interesting time. So apologies, more of a more of a comment. I'm not too sure if either of yourselves have a comment. Yeah, I mean that's the debate around the, the constitutional rights and 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 but ultimately you know, your constitutional rights are not unlimited. So you know, what's good for the country in perspective. That's why I truly believe that some countries will go for compulsory vaccinations and constitutionally, uh, if the vaccine continues to work against the new variants in the, I wish I had a slide to show you. Uh, I, I, I produced a slide out The Economist the other day, where it shows you the infection rates of the current people in the various states. 
and less than 3% of the infection rates come from vaccinated people. 97% in all the states come from people who are unvaccinated. So it's overwhelming evidence that currently, and God willing, it continues to be so, the vaccinations are effective against all the variants, including the Delta variant. Now, we haven't got the results from the new variant that's been found in a couple of countries, including South Africa. But the, the point is, so long as you have that, your constitutional rights to not have the vaccine are overridden. You know, again, I, I can't understand why this vaccination debate is so contentious. I went to India a couple of years ago and I had like 15 jabs and a couple of them were vaccines. I didn't even ask what the vaccines were. I wanted to go to India and took the jabs that were necessary for me to get access into India. So again, uh, uh, it's become, I think, a... And I, I accept it. It's because these vaccines have been developed so quickly and, and there might be some risks attached to it. But the overwhelming scientific evidence that I've seen is uh, in favor of vaccines in respect to the current variants that we know about in South Africa. So I think constitutionally, even in South Africa, with our liberal constitution, if the vaccines continue to be as effective as they've been up to now, I think there's going to be a case made out for compulsory vaccination of the nation. Forget about the... Uh, the company. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Sam Keller, if I may, I would like to raise one question and then I see that there is one more question in our chat. So one of the questions that I have, Johnny, is in circumstances where you've got um, exceptional cases, for example, a pregnant employee, would they still then be subjected to a compulsory vaccination, although it's an area where it's not quite clear? No, because it's an alternative. So again, great question. So there's an alternative. You have your, you, you know, you you could you could be outside the workplace for the period of the pregnancy. Pregnancy is not permanent, thank goodness. It's only for a period of nine months. Have your child and then revert back to the workplace. So there's an alternative beyond the compulsory vaccination. Of course, when I say you could be dismissed in a curt short answer, it's after following a procedure, following the requirements, and getting to the fact that there are no alternatives for you as an employee of this particular company. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Another question from Yumna, any chance of a deep dive session into all of the legislat legislative changes and upcoming amendments on the cards? Yeah, on, on our side and Professor Yumna definitely will look into that. I think it will make sense for Johnny, as you began speaking, you really shared a lot of updates and where it's going. You even mentioned what's happening at NEDLAG, cyber, all other things, 100% Yumna will definitely look into that. Just going over across labor law and saying, what are the changes, but also for our sector, how could they affect us? What are the risks and what can we do practically to mitigate that? A very good point. Thanks Yumna uh, for, uh, for that one. Just uh, another one on, on my, uh, is that all on your side? Uh, Coral, any other questions from the chat? No further questions, Sam Kello. Okay, uh, Johnny, earlier on, and just uh, just to discla uh, disclaimer, because my colleagues from Pepesa, they are here as well. This question I'm asking does not mean that I smoke cannabis. You spoke about cannabis at work, and you use these words, and I'm quoting you there, Jim. You said you are against regular testing at work. So how do we mitigate, how do we manage this thing of some kind of smoking and coming to, to work almost like, so how do we deal with that then? But because you said you are against regular testing. Some killer, I can't disclose on Poppy because you are a regular purchaser of my brand, Johnny Gold. <laughs> I'm joking, I haven't got a brand, Johnny Gold. But it's not a bad brand. You could bring out a brand of, brand of marijuana coming from Eastern Cape called Johnny Gold. The problem with testing is you need to then deal with the result. And again, cannabis stays in your bloodstream and your urine sample for up to maybe three or four weeks. And effectively, if I smoke cannabis on the weekend and come on Monday, it doesn't affect my particular work. That's where you get into trouble. So our preferred approach is to observe. The person is observed to be different to what they normally are at the entrance of the workplace and then only test on those circumstances, not to do random testing. I personally, and I'm happy to have a debate with anyone off this record, I'm personally completely opposed to random testing for drugs and alcohol. I only like to test in regard to where a person shows some type of symptoms or odd behavior. Thank you. Excellent. No, that's fine. So when you mention random testing, is like when you arrive at some international airport and you're standing in a line and someone from TSA pulls you aside and says, Sam Kelo, this is a random search. That's what you, that's what you mean. Correct. 
Okay, that's fine. And then linked to, uh, to the vaccine as well. You spoke about vaccinated employees complaining about unvaccinated employees. Would you like to unpack, uh, to un to unpack that? Are we seeing a, 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 a future scenario where those who are vaccinated will say to us, hang on, what about those who have not? What, what's your thought around that? Yeah, I, that's what I see. I see that the more and more the vaccines, it's interesting if you look at the, app, you know, I think yesterday we did 268,000 vaccines in South Africa again. Um, uh, and that's a hell of a lot of vaccines you're pumping out. We see there's been a big uptake in the 18 to 35 year olds. And then as a result of that, there seem to be a big uptake in the 55 year old plus category as well last week. So it's it seemed that the 18 to 35 year olds are going to get vaccinated and therefore encouraging their parents to get vaccinated too, which is a uh, a turn up for the books. But I see a situation where employees are going to say themselves, we want our whole site to be vaccinated. So I don't want to sit next to some killer unless he's vaccinated too. So we drive it through the Occupation Health and Safety Committee. We've seen that happening in two organizations, and I suspect that's going to happen one more. Excellent. And that's fine. Uh, thanks, Johnny. The, the, uh, oh, yeah. there's, a, there's another question. Do you want to go ahead and ask that one, uh, Coral? Thanks, Johnny. Sure. Thanks, Sam Kello. Question is from Shona. What permissions would we as a company need to obtain before we can enforce regular drug testing, for example, as a client requirement for all agents? Yeah, I'm opposed to regular drug testing. Uh, and we see a lot of international organizations also stopping that because of the problems it produces. So I'm the CEO, Johnny, and I've, I test positive for cannabis. What are you going to do about that? But um, you need in your contract of employment. So the easiest way to deal with that is in your, in your contract of employment. And that's what I would deal with it. I'd put in a contract of, of, of employment, the fact that you'd undergo um, regular random or ad hoc uh, medical tests, which include, uh, and I'd include polygraph examinations in that too, but uh, would you include uh, uh, drug testing or, or medical testing, which includes drug testing for drugs, thanks. Excellent, was that all on your side, uh, Coral? That's it, thanks, Sam Keller. Then in terms of practicality for this group and the HR forum, we have created a WhatsApp group. And if you want to become part of that group, would you just, if you don't mind, just enter your details in the, in the chat so that we can, you can either send us your, your, your number or you can enter them in the chat so that we make you part of the HR forum WhatsApp group. And that is where we will share further information sessions. And also you may ask as well. We really want to increase the number of our members in this sector who are part of that for info sharing, for marketing, but also helping each other because you might have a challenge which speaks to another organization and, uh, as well. So if you don't mind, you can just enter that. Any other things, uh, any other questions from the audience or any other points that you want to add, uh, Johnny, as, as, as we go along? No, I think I'm covered. I think I, I've said a lot, a lot to digest and uh, just reach out to me on email if I can help you. Uh, either that email or johnny at iafrica.com and I'm happy to help you anytime. Uh, and I am linked to your sector and uh, happy to assist and help you to grow and get this sector to thrive. I think we've got to simplify issues though, ladies and gentlemen, as much as possible, including disciplinary inquiries, disciplinary codes and disciplinary procedures. And I would advocate as well that this, you know, these lengthy procedures are just absolute waste of time. You need someone quick and efficient to decide, have we got facts for a case or don't we, if we've got facts for a case, we prosecute and move on. If we don't, we move on with our lives. Thank you. Excellent, that's fine. Carl, I see another question has, has also come true. And believe it or not, uh, somebody called Bright on this bright day has also entered his number and details in the chat box. Carl, do you wanna go ahead and ask that question? Absolutely, thanks, Sam Keller. Uh, the question is from David. What is a reasonable period of time to apply performance management in a measured outbound environment? David, I, I'm, I hope I understand the question correctly, but the problem that I have with traditional performance management is effectively it's too outdated. So it happens say every six months in most organizations, and I think that's too irregular. So I think you've got to have a much quicker, much more effective system of performance management. And that kind of performance management only works for development purposes. 
if there are performance issues, they should be dealt with daily, hourly, weekly. Thanks. Excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I, I think that's all on our side. I know we're finishing just before time, but I don't see any questions. And, and Johnny, you've been a star. I appreciate the way you explain and also how you give examples. The part where you say to your wife uh, that you are also welcome to change my mind. I never did my uh, LLB. I never did my master's in law, but I really want to use that next time I have a debate with my wife that I also work in HR, so I'm allowed to change my mind. Thank you very much uh, to everyone. Any closing remarks on your side? Coral, are you good to go? All good from our side. Thank you so much, Sam Keller, and thank you, Johnny. Johnny's details are also, uh, this, uh, it's also on the screen, and you are more than welcome to contact him for advice, for guidance, and also to engage uh, with, with his company. Thanks to our principals, and thank you to all our members at Pepesa in the sector, our critical strategic partner, um, DTIC Reshni, we see you. Thank you for your attendance and always thank you for your support. Thanks, Johnny, and thank you, everyone. Absolute pleasure. Go safe, get vaccinated. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.